Right, guys, we've uh, we've tried on on Instagram once again. We've failed as we did last week, but I'm welcome welcoming DJ Forbes to Tales from the Sand. Uh, DJ, you know, crazy world right now. How are you, buddy? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Thanks, mate. Um, slowly getting back to a little bit of normality. Um, fortunate on this side of the world, bro. We're uh, back into level one, so I guess we're as free as can be. So um, hopefully, you know, the rest of the world. Um, eventually follows suit and manages to get through I guess yeah some pretty tough times. Yeah absolutely and, and uh, you know I know that we were we were pretty jealous of you guys last week when we saw the crowds in the, in the Super Rugby and it looked uh, it looked fantastic uh, as Auckland got the win as well. Yeah it was um that was awesome to me it was I guess awesome to see the Blues fans turn out probably even more better to see I guess the country uh, back celebrating and rubbing shoulders you know in a full capacity stadium mass gatherings, things like that. So it was really, um, yeah, it was really, uh, especially for my little family, my, my kids, uh, I've got a 10 and a seven year old. They were not too, uh, not too fussed about, about footy, to be honest, but uh, they were keen to see everyone making a bit of noise and, and jumping in the crowd. Awesome. So let's just dive in. Uh, one of the things that we want to sort of look back on is, is some of your career. You're a name that's synonymous with rugby sevens. I know on my side of the world, the English boys are all, have jousted with you for years. Um, Talk to me about, it's 2006, I think, when you made your first debut for, for New Zealand and the sport was very different uh, to, to the one that we know now 14 years later. What are your memories of, of the World Series when you first started playing? Yeah, um, I, I guess that was um, my first Dubai, but it was the back end of my, I guess, my first season. So I, I you know, debuted in Wellington, so I played from Wellington onwards and, and, then, and then we started the the fresh cycle, so to speak, of the of the World Series from you know, from my uh, perspective. So, um, yeah, Dubai was interesting. I, I think if I remember, and you're going to have to jog my memory on, on, on a lot of these ones, bro. It's been a while, um, but I think uh, Tafai Hiwasa was still in the team then. Um, he was carrying a little bit of an injury, so I think I may have been captain um, for that Dubai tournament, um, and it was only like yeah, I guess. Uh, nine months after I had made the team, so I kind of got thrusted into that. So I may I may have been sort of a little bit overwhelmed with um, potentially, uh, you know, having the bracket seat bracket by my name and trying to come to terms with you know this this new um, form of the game that I was playing. So um, never would have dreamt of going to Dubai to play footy, um, being in the middle of the desert and, and running around chasing a ball was was uh, definitely you know one of those sort of dreams come true moments. Um, but yeah, there was obviously the reality of responsibility that comes with uh, playing in the black jersey as well. Talk to me a bit about that, about that culture wearing the black jersey. I know that we, we talk about the All Blacks, but what about Gordon Titchens' New Zealand Sevens? What are your memories of that when you first joined that team? Yeah, well, um, to, be, to be honest, all I really heard about the culture was how hard and how tough he was. Um, the, the strict regime he had everyone running um, nutrition wise you know professionalism um, you know, all the types of I guess uh, field trainings that your classic 15s player probably wouldn't want to do so um, keeping in mind yeah I was a uh, I was playing 15s and 7s bouncing back and forth um, so yeah it was kind of a, a rude awakening but I think what he did and still from early on was you know work ethic um, discipline you know professionalism and, and having you know high standards so um, it was for us, we were a bunch of new kids. In 2006, there would have been like a dozen of us that had never played sevens before, that had never been on that on that scene. Um, so we were, yeah, we were, it was a little baptism of fire, so to speak. And then, you know, over time, we grew into that culture. Um, over, over, I guess, a few more years, we started, you know, sort of developing that culture. And, and, and eventually, um, probably what you see more of now is, you know, those boys, especially those old boys running around now, you know, really led their next, uh, their next culture uh, moving forward. What is it? And much has been made of, of just how many New Zealand Sevens players have gone on and played for the All Blacks. What is it that, that, that sort of sets so many of these players up to take to the next step? What is it you think about that particular culture or environment that sets people up? Um, well, I, th I think it's definitely a taste of what's next. You know, um, Titch earlier on had you know, the knack of identifying players that were sort of on the fringe or um, players that needed just to, you know, take that next step. Um, so you could imagine, you know, taking these players around the world, playing in, you know, full capacity stadiums, 
um, the expectation of wearing the black jersey and, and things like that kind of put a lot of things in place, um, but at a faster rate. So, you know, um, you, you'd have these guys, you know, with, with X Factor written all over them. I remember like Julian Savia, um, when he when he came in, he was sort of a little bit chubby and all that, but he was a wrecking ball um, and just needed to, you know, fine tune a few things. And so Titch's environment in particular um, made that made that pretty easy because, you know, in order to make the team, you had to be doing some, some pretty hard work and, I guess that's why everyone started to get an appreciation of if you wanted to be in that environment. Um, it was a different work ethic, you know, there was um, you know, high expectations, but you know, being able to play on an international stage, got freedom to run around, um, you know, freedom to express yourself was the best way for some of these, you know, or the All Blacks that we see running around now to really um, fast track their careers. You had some pretty glorious moments in what turned out to be a, a a career that spans probably the early part of the World Series into the Olympic era. Um, what are the big differences that you, that you see now in the sport that you first of all played under Titch to the sport maybe when you retired in 2017? Well, I think, you know, um, the amount of countries that are putting resource and time and effort into building these, um, you know, sevens players and, and sevens teams. Um, I think for us, we were fortunate that, you know, we... Um, you know, played rugby, you know, growing up from a young age. So that was, you know, half half the task. Um, and then with, you know, Titch's tutelage and, you know, the boys really wanting to work together, um, you know, managed to put some real good things in place. Um, but it was just one of those things, I think, you know, along the way, um, you know, just trying to understand how it all sort of came together for us, you know. So it was, you know, interesting times. And I've been in that, yeah, like you said, in that decade where I saw the early stages and saw, I guess, um, but there's now and um, probably the, the athlete themselves, the footy player themselves has changed. You've got guys that are, you know, six foot plus, 100 kegs, you know, sprinting around. So, you know, a lot of these you know, athletes, you know, uh, are tailor-made for sevens. Um, you've got, you know, um, cross sports, you know, coming across. You've got track and field. You've got NFL players. You know, you've got all these athletes now that are putting their hand up for an Olympic opportunity. So it's really changed the game. Um, the women's game is growing, you know, tenfold. I um, mean, I think just there's a lot of you know, young kids now seeing um, rugby sevens as a real viable opportunity to represent your country at you know, the Commonwealth Games. At the Olympics. We're going to share some images of, that we found from, from your career. And uh, I suppose to get us started, before we even like, talk about those, what are the, when you look at that, what are, what are your, your favourite memories of the World Series? Are there, there particular victories? Not talking about Dubai now, but just... You know, on the series, what are your, some of your favourite memories? Oh, uh, all right, you know, there's a, there's a few and there's some, and I kind of, I could kind of go back to a lot of those photos that you've tucked up there yeah. um, and sort of remember those moments. You know, I've got a lot of respect for those Samoan boys, especially in Little Louis era. Um, obviously being half Kiwi, half Samoan, um, had some real good battles and there was that year that, you know, that they dominated uh, the World Series. Um, I guess, yeah, there's a bottom left corner, I think is Hong Kong, um, you know, and, and I think everyone sort of looks at that um, with the history that's involved in Hong Kong and, you know, the amount of times and the amount of legends that, you know, went through the, the Hong Kong Sevens phase. Um, and I'm pretty sure that one uh, with Tomasi was from uh, from Dubai. Yes. From, from, you can tell by the trophy, so yeah. Um, and those are, you know, like, I think every time going to Dubai, um, there was always something new going on. Um, there was always some building going up, um, and, and just to know, you know, for almost what it's probably a few more, a few few more days now, maybe four or five days of the year, um, Dubai really turned it on and gave everyone a real opportunity to um, to celebrate, you know, sport and the way that they've changed, I guess, their tournament these days, where they've got you know the invitational um, footy as well as netball. They've got a massive concert that goes on. They've really turned it into a real spectacle and. Um, you know, I guess, you know, sitting, sitting the bar in, in, in a lot of regards. Hey, just talking about Dubai, as you touch on it there, do we, uh, do we think there's ever a possibility that DJ Forbes will run out in our vets competition? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard case. So, um, you know, to, to be fair, when I um, retired from footy, I actually, um, you know, stepped out and got into a bit of coaching. Um, and, you know, that's obviously a, a passion of mine. And I was sort of doing satellite uh, coaching academies around, around the globe, funny enough. And, um, that was kind of like the intention if I could, you know, do a bit of coaching and still, you know, be in the game. I'm still running around and trying to keep the body in good nick and um, an invitational um, tournament 
um, at any or in any country would be awesome. Um, I just think for now the timing is off um, because I've obviously got a, <laughs> I've got an office job nine to five, um, which you know has its uh, restrictions. But yeah, definitely. I mean, I played club footy um, last year, and the, the club is asking me to go around again. Um, so I think if my you know my schedule allows eventually once I've settled in my role uh, for sure, if my body's still still willing, I'll definitely be keen to get to Dubai. And I've been asked you know several times by several you know teams that I was so close to going. Um, last year but again it was just the timing and trying to make it work and obviously getting the, the hall pass from the wife was probably the, the big part of it as well. After after 10 years of free pass it becomes uh, becomes a little bit more difficult to say you're going to go and play the Vets tournament right? Yeah yeah for sure and she had the, her classic line is if it's if it's not your job anymore then yeah what are you, what are you really going for? So, <laughs> yeah. Talk about uh, I know that especially for for Players of of a certain age that have uh, that have uh, you know, known professionalism for so long. How challenging was it for you to to move from travelling all over the world for you know ten eleven years to to moving into an office job? Was that a big challenge for you? Yeah, it was massive. I think I was fortunate when I like took a bit of a leap, um, jumped into the, the coaching and started my you know I guess coaching business. Um, that was still sort of in that niche, so it kind of still felt normal. You know, you know, travel for a couple of weeks and do coaching, so it was still sort of rugby. You know, I'd be away, then I'd come home, and I could, you know, fully commit to being at home and doing the kids' drop offs and pickups and things like that. But yeah, and I'm, you know, in all honesty, I'm still, you know, heavily in the transition mode. Um, for me, sitting in an office is still not normal, and, and you know, people, I guess my my mates sort of laugh about. And they probably give me a bit of stick behind my back about how hard I'm training or what I'm up to and posting this and that. But it's purely just um, an hour or so where I actually feel normal. Um, because like you said, I was so used to chasing the ball around and, and having an athlete mindset that, you know, you sort of have a goal each day and you tick the box and you're done. Whereas now, you know, I go to work, um, you've got all these to-do things, you know, might have a list of 10 things to do. I've uh, managed to do three or four and I come home and with the athlete mindset on, I'm thinking that I failed or, you know, I wasn't productive, I didn't do enough, I didn't achieve. When in reality, you know, that's the way the, the corporate world or, the, you know, the organisation kind of works. You, you just got to keep, you know, keep chipping away. So I think for me, it's just really building my, you know, um, capabilities and learning new things, um, changing my mindset a little bit to, to know that, you know, what I'm going through is normal. Um, and I guess in the space I'm in, just trying to, um, let more of our athletes know that yeah, this is all part of that transition phase. Talk about that because like, you're working with the Olympic team, is that right? Yeah, so I'm the athlete engagement manager for our Olympic committee. So really, kind of open my eyes. I've obviously come from a privileged rugby background, and then dealing with other sports that you know have some sort of support, some have no support, um, and then obviously sort of sitting in their space, we're trying to find ways, um, you know, alongside our our organisation to to help um, you know uh, better educate, better engage, better empower our athletes to you know give them the best opportunity to go out and perform, but also have a, a well balanced um, career. Yeah, I mean we we uh, we we had Chris Pratton on a few weeks ago, and he talked about some of the challenges that, that he'd faced both uh, as a player transitioning from a player to being a coach, and then a coach onwards afterwards, and that you know. It was a very, very difficult thing for him, and that he's still going through that. And, and perhaps the the rugby player and sportsman of today is given a little bit more of an opportunity from people like yourself to share those experiences. That perhaps it will be easier in the future for those players. Is that something that you want to share? Yeah, that's definitely the plan. Um, and I guess, yeah, like you said, it's it's you know fitting that. Um, a lot of the content that I'll be trying to create or looking to build with the, you know, the organization is based around some of my own experiences and in, 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 in ensuring that these athletes, you know, what they actually go through in that transition phase um, is, you know, the best possible outcome that we can give. And so, um, like anything, yeah, just you know, my own experiences help because I can kind of, um, you know, it's a lot easier to share and to talk through things, but then also to bring things to the forefront. Um, you know, with an athlete lens on, I can actually say to you, you know, the NZOC, you know, this is what I'm going through, this is what I went through. Um, and then just trying to build, yeah, build templates and build a bit of structure around that. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, like I said, it's a new space for the NZOC and it's obviously a new role for me. So there's no magic formula. Um, but based on, you know, a lot of my own learnings, I've even, you know, done a bit of study around, 
um, athlete coach relationship and things like that. So, you know, just trying to find that medium as best I can to really help um, who I can, when I can. And uh, do your experiences as a, as a captain with, with Sir Gordon Titchens as your coach, do a lot of those experiences correlate or was Titch so extreme that maybe not? Or, you know, how does that fit? Um, yeah, I, I think, um, oh, I mean, there's, you know, I'm, I'm not going to lie, there's definitely some things that um, Titch um, did and the way he did, did them, you know, obviously benefited me and, and instilled in me a lot of, a lot of good things. Um, at the same time, you know, coming into, I guess, coming to terms of how I would want to coach and, and, and what I've learned over time, there's definitely a lot of things that I'll do differently. And um, I think that was probably my, the benefit of doing my studies at the back end of my career, when I was still playing, I was able to try and live out what I was studying or what I was learning and apply, I guess, you know, different uh, methods and my philosophies, you know, in my own environment, you know, with the, with the boys. And then, yeah, I guess now I'm at a stage where I can kind of, um, well, I've created my own template or my own way of coaching um, if I ever go down that track again, but I can still apply it in, in the, you know, the role I'm in now around that whole you know, relationship with um, athletes currently um, and how to better sort of, I guess, motivate them and, and to make sure that we can engage, um, you know, the way we need to. Uh, you touched on uh, that if anybody follows you on social, they probably see that you, you get after it in the, in the gym still and you probably don't mind a donut or a cheat meal. Um, is that, is that uh, are those sort of traits that are from being a player that, you know, as you say, it makes you feel normal for that hour? Is that something that you still really like to do, make sure that you're in the best shape you can be and, and set that experience for your kids? Yeah, um, I, and I think, you know, obviously there's, everyone talks about it, I just want to be in a, a healthy state, a healthy frame of mind. So I'm, I'm around and I'm here for as long as I can for my kids, but also to be active enough to, you know, to do what they want to do and, and to be able to, you know, run around with them as well. But yeah, for, for me, um, yeah, you're right. It's probably, I probably do a lot more bad eating now, obviously, but um, a simple formula is calories in, calories out. So I'm just making sure that I find a way to sweat as much as I can whenever I do a workout because um, I know that usually I'm going to be putting in some some bad calories um, to probably make up for a few years, maybe close to 11 or 12 years where where a certain coach wouldn't let me eat what I wanted to eat. So um, <laughs> that's what I'm trying to pass a lot of day. But no, I think, yeah, it's just really now it's all about, you know, just balancing and enjoying. I know I put my body through a, a bit of hell in those early days. So now it's, you know, being able to still go to that dark place, but I probably treat it with a few more rewards um, than I used to. There's obviously some unbelievable sort of both memories and iconic moments that you and the All Black side were part of. I think back and think of, you know, the hacker in the rain in Hong Kong and, uh, and equally perhaps the world's most boring Rugby Sevens World Cup final as you and England kicked it to each other in Moscow. Um, <laughs> but but you've got to do what you've got to do, right? Um, what, about, what about the impact of, of New Zealand and the performance in 2016? Do you think that that sets a tone for what might happen in in Tokyo, has that been a big goal for that group off of the back of Rio going into Tokyo? I definitely think that, yeah, there'll be a lot of those core players that will probably have that, um, you know, feeling in the back of their mind. Um, I know for me, you know, that was probably the nucleus of my, my study, you know, just what we went through. Um, you know, there were a lot of things, I guess, behind the scenes and in-house that probably weren't clicking. Um, but as a, you know, as a team, we were never going to, you know, show that. And, and, and to be fair, you know, right up until the last... You know, a few seconds of that quarterfinal, um, you know, we, we, we could have done it with, with nine men, you know. Um, and it's one of those things where, yeah, you know, you sort of, you live and you learn. Um, and if, if we could have, you know, changed a few things, we may have. But um, I know that, yeah, the, the, the boys would be better off for it. And um, I think if anything, you know, it's going to, you know, give them more drive. Um, it may, to a degree, take a little bit of pressure off, um, although they have been going, you know, pretty awesome lately. Um, obviously, or, you know, all the, all the drama went down. But, yeah, I, I think just not going in with that, you know, uh, I guess common or how that traditional, you know, expectation of always just, you know, expected to win, expected to win. I think the boys can really go out this time around, this campaign, and just enjoy the footy. And for some of them, you know, I'm only assuming, but it, it probably could be this one song. So I think there'll be a lot to play for for this, uh, for this group of men. One of the big changes that you've probably seen over... Uh, the growth of sevens during your involvement has been the women's game. And, you know, 
we're very proud here in Dubai that we've hosted uh, the women here every year that the Women's Series has existed and it's something that we're really committed to and, and in New Zealand you're blessed with a pretty talented team. Um, what is it that you've seen from the women's game? What's impressed you most in, in the women's game as, as it's now, you know, on equal footing with the men? Um, oh, it's, yeah, I mean, there's so many things there eh, when you look at, um, and there's no disrespect, but, you know, when you compare it to, I guess, women's, you know, rugby 10 years ago, like, like these, these ladies are, um, you know, talented, or, you know, beasts in the gym, um, you know, they do some amazing stuff on the field. I, I think, if anything, you know, if we're being, well, if I'm being honest, just the quality of footy that these girls are playing these days is unreal, you know, and um, I think, yeah, you, you touched on it in terms of New Zealand, you know, women's, um, or, you know, girls, young kids, you know, playing rugby, it's, it's really blowing up. And I think uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at our current crop of, of you know, um, Black Fern Sevens, you know, um, women, they're really setting that path for advocacy around, you know, these these powerful wahine tours, you know, standing up and and, and, and mixing up with the boys and, and representing and creating their own pathway and, you know, leaving, you know, really a lot of them, you know, are still young in their game by creating legacies, um, you know, for all these you know, young young girls to, to look up to. So they're really paving the way, I think, for, you know, for sport in general, but, you know, for the women's game, um, definitely. And clearly in New Zealand, that's something that's been uh, been taken really well by the wider rugby public. Uh, I, you know, the way that you were taught there and the way that many of the other players and spectators, you know, the Blackfern Sevens and their success and their athleticism is really paving a way for you know, maybe daughters like your, like your own to pick up a footy and, and play ball. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, the, uh, the more and more that these girls do their thing, um, you know, the, the more records they break and the more... You know, bars they sit, you're just going to see more and more um, not just young girls coming through, but women wanting to you know, jump out of their, their current sports, jumping out of netball or, or volleyball or whatever it is, to come in and be a part of, I guess, what looks like an awesome culture to be involved with. You know, um, these, these girls, you know, across their team have an awesome following. So what they've created, you know, not just as rugby players, but as, yeah. um, as heroes and as idols and That's legends and yeah, yeah, that's really, um, really, really doing a good thing for you know rugby in general, but for the women's game especially. And I just wanted to, before we close, and thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, one of the big things we want to do is celebrate the people that have made an, an enormous impact on Dubai. And when you walk into our our stadium, and there's there's the shot of of the All Blacks winning and, and, and you lifting that trophy, and it's become pretty iconic for us. And, Thank you so much for all of those memories over the years. You're certainly warmly thought of here, not just because Emirates has got so many Kiwis working for us either, but uh, you know, across the board. What about what about players that you played with or against? Is there are there are there are uh, there say three players that really stick out for you as as trailblazers? Um, I think from our, you know, from our team. Yeah, Tomasi was our, our little general for a long time, and, uh, and he really, he really, um, really ran, ran a pretty tight kind of when he was on the field. Uh, he probably didn't get, well, everyone knows he's a legend in, in his own right. And, um, I guess comparisons to like, you know, uh, Cerebi and all those kind of um, legend, legends. Um, and I, you know, I easy, easily put him right up there with, you know, one of the best, if not, you know, the best you know, playmaker that I've ever played with. Uh, it's exciting times, and, and like I say, those memories of, of those early teams on the 
countries, be it Samoa or, or the early All Black side in South Africa when they were first won the series. They're iconic memories for here, us here in Dubai. We're certainly excited to welcome you back at, at some point to come and play in our next tournament. Um, and, uh, and I know that there's a number of teams around the world that would be excited for that. And, and when you do come back to the Dubai Sevens, you'll certainly be welcome back as a, as a legend of the Dubai Sevens. Uh, thank you ever so much for joining us today. Really excited. Uh, we hope that the World Series will return. Obviously, lockdown is crazy, and and, and we're trying to treat life like normal and, and be in the best place possible to, to welcome the world in, in December. If we can, and we will. Uh, thank you for joining us today, and it's great to catch up. Appreciate it, DJ. Thanks, brother.